the Great Sphinx of Giza, a colossal figure with a lion's body and a human head, stands as a potent symbol of ancient Egypt, a silent sentinel guarding the pyramids and the secrets of a bygone era. Its enigmatic presence has fueled countless theories and speculations about its origins and purpose. Recently, a flurry of media attention surrounded a New York University, NYU study, with headlines proclaiming a new origin story for the Sphinx, that it was primarily shaped by wind erosion before any human intervention. This narrative, while seemingly intriguing, crumbles under the weight of established archaeological and geological evidence, offering a misleadingly simplistic explanation for a monument born of complex human planning and execution. The NYU researchers, led by Leif Ristroff, conducted a laboratory experiment aimed at exploring the potential of wind erosion to sculpt rock formations into recognizable shapes. Specifically, they investigated whether a naturally occurring, roughly conical mound of material with a harder inclusion, representing the head, could be eroded by a consistent, unidirectional flow of water, simulating wind, into a form resembling a seated lion. Their model used a mound of bentonite clay, a material known for its susceptibility to erosion, with a short cylindrical piece of plastic embedded near the top to represent the harder rock that makes up the Sphinx's head. This model was placed in a water tunnel, and the flow was carefully controlled to come from a single direction, mimicking a constant wind. Over time, the water eroded the clay, creating a neck-like structure below the head and rudimentary pores at the base. The researchers documented this process using streak-like imaging, showcasing how the flow sculpted the clay. The experiment did demonstrate that, under these highly specific and controlled conditions, a vaguely leonine shape could emerge. This led the researchers to suggest that a similar process might have occurred at Giza, with natural wind erosion creating a proto-sphinx that later inspired and guided the final carving by ancient Egyptians. While the NYU experiment is scientifically valid within its own parameters, its applicability to the actual Great Sphinx is severely limited, and indeed, fundamentally flawed. The experiment's assumptions clash dramatically with the well-established historical and geological realities of the Giza Plateau. Realities meticulously documented over centuries of archaeological and geological investigation. The most glaring discrepancy lies in the very foundation of the Sphinx. The NYU model presupposes a freestanding mound, exposed to wind from all sides. The Great Sphinx, however, sits within a deeply quarried hollow, carved down into the bedrock of the Giza Plateau. This is not a minor detail. It is the defining characteristic of the monument's creation. The Sphinx's pores, which emerged naturally in the experiment, were, in reality, painstakingly excavated by human hands, a testament to the immense labor and planning involved in the project. This practice of quarrying massive amounts of stone is a hallmark of Old Kingdom Egyptian construction, evident in the pyramids, the valley temples, and countless other monuments. The very act of creating the Sphinx enclosure removed any pre-existing natural formation that might have vaguely resembled a lion. The NYU experiment relies on a crucial and ultimately incorrect assumption, a constant unidirectional wind. The winds at Giza, both today and in antiquity, are far more complex and variable. Meteorological records, as well as historical accounts of sandstorms and wind patterns, demonstrate that Giza experiences winds from multiple directions, subject to seasonal shifts and unpredictable gusts. This variability would have prevented the formation of the precisely oriented, symmetrical erosion patterns observed in the controlled environment of the water tunnel. The assumption of a single prevailing wind simply does not hold up to scrutiny. The Sphinx's weathering is a far more intricate story than simply wind erosion. Its geological history, spanning millions of years, involves a complex interplay of forces, each leaving its mark on the monument. Tectonic activity. The Giza Plateau is not geologically static. Tectonic shifts and fault lines have created significant cracks and fissures within the Sphinx, features entirely absent from the smooth, homogeneous clay of the NYU model. These cracks, documented by geologists like Colin Reeder, 
significantly influence weathering patterns. Groundwater intrusion and salt exfoliation. The lower portions of the Sphinx, closer to the ancient water table, have been subjected to groundwater wicking. This process draws water up through the porous limestone, carrying dissolved salts. As the water evaporates, the salts crystallize, exerting pressure on the rock and causing it to flake and crumble, a process known as salt exfoliation. This is a major factor in the Sphinx's deterioration, particularly evident in the lower body and pores. Rainfall and runoff. Although rainfall is relatively infrequent in the Giza Desert today, historical records and geological evidence suggest that periods of more intense rainfall occurred in the past. These events would have contributed to erosion through surface runoff, carving channels, and further shaping the monument in ways not accounted for in the unidirectional flow of the experiment. Of the makeup of the rock. The experiment failed to account for the different rock hardness that is present at Giza. The bottom and top are harder, while the middle is a softer rock. The NYU experiment fundamentally misrepresents the geology of the Sphinx. It depicts the head as a single, isolated, harder inclusion embedded within a softer surrounding material. In reality, the hard, resistant limestone that forms the Sphinx's head is part of a continuous stratum that extends across the entire Giza Plateau. This same layer was extensively quarried by the ancient Egyptians to provide the massive blocks used to construct the Great Pyramid, a testament to its durability and extent. Geological surveys, core samples, and the visible evidence of quarrying all confirm this. The Sphinx was carved down into this pre-existing layered geological formation, a crucial fact that invalidates the experiment's basic premise. Wind-sculpted rock formations, known as yardangs, are a real geological phenomenon. In arid environments with consistent unidirectional winds and specific rock compositions, they can sometimes resemble animals or other recognizable shapes. However, the specific conditions required for the formation of a yardang resembling the NYU model's outcome, a small, isolated, hard inclusion within a much larger mass of softer, easily erodible material, coupled with unwavering unidirectional wind, are not representative of the Giza Plateau's complex geological history and variable wind patterns. While a yardang might have existed in the general area before the Sphinx enclosure was quarried, it could not have resembled the final form of the Sphinx and crucially, it would have been removed during the quarrying process. The NYU research, while scientifically sound within its own limited scope, offers no credible explanation for the origin of the Great Sphinx of Giza. The overwhelming weight of archaeological and geological evidence, accumulated over centuries of study, points unequivocally to the Sphinx as a monument deliberately conceived, planned, and meticulously carved by ancient Egyptian artisans. The quarrying marks, the alignment with other Old Kingdom structures, the geological layering, and the complex history of weathering all contradict the simplistic wind-made narrative. If you like this video, then buckle up because you're going to love our next adventure. Get ready to discover the mystery of the bizarre ear tablets found near the Great Sphinx of Giza. That's right. We're diving deep into the ancient Egyptian practice of creating these strange votive offerings, also known as ear steli, during the New Kingdom period. We'll explore their possible connection to the god Horemaket, the Sphinx himself, and even other deities like Tar. We're talking history, archaeology, and the hidden meaning behind these fascinating artifacts. Were they used for prayers? What secrets do the inscriptions hold? Join us next time as we uncover the secrets of ancient Egypt and these unique ear tablets. You won't want to miss it. The sands of Egypt hold countless secrets, whispers of a civilization that flourished thousands of years ago. We are captivated by the grandeur of the pyramids, the enigmatic gaze of the Sphinx, and the intricate hieroglyphs that adorn temple walls. But sometimes, the most intriguing mysteries are found in the smaller, seemingly unusual artifacts. Today, we delve into one such enigma, the curious case of ancient Egyptian ear tablets. Our story begins in the 1930s, near the majestic Great Sphinx of Giza. Dr. Salim Hassan, a prominent Egyptologist, was leading excavations in and around the New Kingdom Sphinx Temple built by Amenhotep II, as well as within the Sphinx's enclosure itself. Amidst the expected finds, 
something peculiar emerged. Stone steely, not inscribed with the usual hieroglyphs or divine figures, but with carvings of human ears. These were not isolated occurrences. Dozens of these ear tablets were unearthed, presenting a perplexing puzzle.